Hey guys, this is Mr. Mitchell. Today we're going to be talking about elastic potential energy or EPE. Um, we've already discussed elastic force in a good amount of detail at this point, so we're familiar with you know, elastic materials like springs and bungee cords. We've talked about the elastic constant and how that determines you know, um, how easy or how difficult it is to stretch or compress a material. We've talked about the elastic limit, where if we go past that, it's no longer going to return to its original shape. Um, and so this is really just kind of the application of the, the energy as a whole instead of the specifics of the force. Um, so let's start off by just defining elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy is simply the energy that's stored in stretched or compressed materials. And so we've done all these labs where we're stretching things out and kind of recording forces that we saw, or we just recently did a lab with a car and we we're seeing how far it went up the ramp um, based on the spring to shoot it up the ramp. Um, but it's just the energy that gets stored inside those materials. So we looked at the force, we looked at the distance. We're talking about now the energy that's stored inside that then gets released as force or as you know distances or kinetic energy. Um, it can be stored in all types of different materials. A uh, couple big ones are you know rubber bands. We've dealt with that. Rubber band when I stretch it out is storing energy inside. Okay. It can be stored in a spring, right? We've, again, done something like this where we stretch the spring out and we see like the spring wants to go back because it's got that energy stored inside. When I let it go, it releases all that energy to go back. The third example is one that we're probably not very familiar with, or at least we wouldn't naturally think that rock is something that's elastic, but rock is definitely an elastic material. Even though it seems extremely difficult to stretch or to compress or to bend, you would think that it would just break, just like you see in this picture here. But actually, this breaking is a result of all that elastic energy that was stored being released as kinetic energy. And so uh, rock, or elastic energy that's stored inside rocks, is actually the foundation for earthquakes that are happening. So let's talk about that for a second here. Rock can be considered an elastic material, despite what we may think, all right? And rock does bend and it does want to get back to its original shape. So an earthquake is just kind of a buildup over a very long period of time of elastic energy in the rocks that are just slowly moving, all right? And all that energy that's stored, it gets to a point where it reaches maybe that elastic limit. It can't store anymore. And so all that energy just gets released in kinetic and what you see is a lot like that picture on the last page where all the kinetic energy makes those rocks just shatter into multiple pieces or shatter along a line. All right, and so that is just the transformation of elastic energy going into kinetic energy to move the rock. Um, it's this concept of elastic rebound, all right, and that's what they refer to it as in geology. And it's illustrated in this really simple diagram down here. There's actually a supplemental video in our module right below this video, and it explains that in greater detail than I'm about to, so you might want to go check that out. It's only like two minutes long, and it's, it, it, the guy does a really good job of explaining it. But um, more or less what this geologist did was he took a core sample of rock, okay, so it's just a tube of rock that he drilled out, and he sliced it down the middle, right down this line here, but he didn't slice it all the way to the end. He left it, you know, only sliced part way. And what you can do, just like this student is doing here, is you can squeeze the end of the rock together and you'll see that right where that slice is, the rock kind of squeezes together and when you let go of it, it goes back. And that's the definition of something being elastic, that you can stretch it out of place and then when you let it go, it returns. And so that's just a really nice way of illustrating and seeing that rock is in fact an elastic material, even though we don't naturally think that way. So as far as EPE is concerned, uh, when we go to calculate it, EPE is, is a complex function. It is not linear. And this chart down here is actual data from the car crash, or not the car crash, the car um, lab that we just recently did. So you put uh, the car down on the block, you compress the spring, you press the button, and it shoots the car up the ramp. And then we compress it to a distance that's a little bit further, and it shoots a little further up the ramp. And then we compress it to a distance a little further, it goes even further up the ramp. So uh, for, you know, the two centimeter compression, it went, I don't know, 17 centimeters here, 17 centimeters. For the four centimeter compression, it went like 45 centimeters. And then for the six centimeter compression, it went, I don't know, 95 centimeters. So... This is a complex function because it's not linear. Anything that's not linear, linear is considered simple. Complex is basically anything else. 
And a linear example requires that we have a constant rate of change. So since I have a jump from here to here that goes 17 to 45, let's just round that off and say it's about 20. And then from 45 to 95 is a change of about 50. Well, that's not constant at all. That's, that's definitely not a constant rate of change. And so that can't be a linear function. It's a complex one. And so we see kind of this rounded off graph. It looks like an exponential almost because it is. It's a squared function. So that stems from this equation over here. We have the elastic potential energy equation, right? It looks very much like our kinetic energy equation. And the kinetic energy equation was very similar looking because we said this velocity term is squared. Well, now we see that the um, compression distance or stretch distance term is squared, and that's what makes the graph look this way. So we can use this to explain both why the graph is um, a complex function, but we can also use it to then go ahead and calculate how much elastic potential energy is stored inside of a material. And we see that it depends upon that elastic constant, so how difficult is it to stretch, and then how far did I actually stretch it out. That's what EPE depends upon. So let's go ahead and practice that. We're going to calculate this. Kiera is stretching a rubber band to shoot her older brother. If the rubber band has an elastic constant of 40 and she stretches it a distance of 0.05 meters, 5 centimeters, how much EPE is stored in the rubber band? So we always start off with our givens, right? We'll just write those down really quickly. The first thing we see is the elastic constant of 40. So K equals 40. And there's no units associated with that. And she stretches it a distance of 0.05 meters. So the X value is going to be 0.05 meters. We go ahead over here, we write the equation. The equation is EPE is one half the elastic constant times the stretch or compression distance squared. And then when I come down to do the work and the solution, I'm going to rewrite that equation. Elastic potential energy is one half the elastic constant times the stretch of compression distance squared, and now I just start plugging the numbers in. Instead of writing a half, I'm going to replace it with 0 0.5 because it's just easier when I do the calculations. Um, for the K value, the elastic constant was 40, so I'll replace that with 40. And then the X, the stretch of compression distance, it was stretched out 0 0.05 meters, and we know that that has to get squared. So don't forget PEMDAS. And that tells me, right, that I have to deal with the exponents before I deal with the multiplication. So I have to square my stretch distance before I do anything else. So I'll leave these first two numbers alone, leave them exactly the same, 0 0.5 and 40. And I'm going to square the 0 0.05. When I do that, I get 0 0.0025. And now that I've dealt with my exponents, I can go ahead and multiply. So I'll multiply 0.5 by 40 and I get 20. Multiply that by this and I get ultimately 0.05 joules of EPE. So our answer would say, right, Kiera gave the rubber band 0.05 joules of elastic potential energy. Pretty straightforward considering that we've done these equations before. We did the, you know, the kinetic energy equations. They looked a lot like this. The only important thing that I, I don't want you guys to forget is that we need to square that term before we do anything else because the order of operations tells us we need to do that. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, any of the problems you'll encounter with this are going to look very much like that. Um, hopefully this was helpful for kind of exploring elastic potential energy a little bit more instead of just, you know, the forces that we experience. About the energy that the materials can store and how that energy can be released in a variety of ways by letting go of a rubber band or even in something as big as, you know, rocks breaking and causing an earthquake.